Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for giving a long enough introduction that we could actually get the laptop set up. Um, so I'm actually just going to give the motivation in this talk. Can you turn down the volume a little bit? Okay. All right. So I'm just going to give the uh, motivation for uh, this talk, and then Shang will actually give all the interesting details about how we're using Charm++. So um, in case you've been living under a rock, uh, the most recent thing we've done is Frozen. It's been a big hit. One of the things that show up in Frozen, of course, when we have a princess, is the princess needs a dress. So Elsa has a beautiful dress. Uh, that's made of cloth. Uh, if we go back to Tangled, we had Rapunzel that, besides the very long hair, also had a dress. The uh, Mother Gothel, the villain in Tangled, had a dress and a cape. So we've got cloth simulation uh, in pretty much all our recent movies, and it's a pretty critical component for a family-oriented movie. So let's do the basics of cloth simulation. Um, we have a step that's material force computation, dynamics update. There's a step doing collision detection. And then there's a collision response. And that's basically, once you've detected the collision, what do you do about them? How do you handle them? Um, and in theory, that's all good and fine. The problem is, um, if everything is not working perfectly well, then you may end up getting something that looks like this, which is not so good. So ideally, we'd like a principled simulation where we can satisfy a number of guarantees. We don't want to miss any collisions whatsoever. We want some notion of correctness. We'd like to follow the laws of physics, at least initially. Later on, we'll then go break them, um, but we'll break them in an artistic way wherever we need to and we want to. But as a starting point, it's good to have something that's actually physically correct. And then finally, we also would like to guarantee some notion of progress. It should f finish in a finite amount of time, or we'll never get our movie out. So a couple of years ago, I worked on a project in collaboration with uh, people at Columbia University where we did what we called um, asynchronous contact mechanics. And we get these three guarantees through uh, the use of what we call nested penalty layers for uh, dealing with collisions. The progress, interestingly enough, uh, related to Charm++ is also achieved through asynchrony. And uh, I'll talk a tiny bit more about that on the next slide. And then to get the, the correct behavior, we use um, what's known as symplectic integrators. Um, so the asynchrony in this context is really important, because when we have uh, simulations with intricate uh, collisions, then we're collisions happen, we need to be really careful in order not to mess things up. But elsewhere, I don't know if this has a pointer. It doesn't. Oh, yeah. OK, so where there's collisions, we need to be really careful. But where there are no collisions, we can be um, more relaxed. So that's our notion of asynchrony. Where there's a contact, we need small time steps. Where there's uh, no contact. We want to be able to take large time steps. And those can um, be independent of each other. Um, in order to make this work, what we're doing is kind of a speculative uh, execution framework with the rollback. So we uh, time step all these elements uh, at various rates, depending on what's necessary in, in that spatial region. And we run a whole uh, window. At the end of that window, when everything has stepped to, to the end, we see, did we commit any crimes? Did we 
actually violate any collisions. Uh, and if so, then we roll back the whole simulation. We try one more time, but this time with um, some penalty forces inserted where the collisions happen. And if those uh, penalty forces, or you can think of them as little springs, are sufficient, then we're done. And otherwise, if our little ball here in our example still goes through the wall, as it does over here, then we repeat one more time. We insert additional um, springs or penalty forces so that we end up with a trajectory that has no collisions with this wall in the middle. Um, and let the rinse repeat as often as necessary, hopefully not too often, but that's the idea. So with that in place, we are now able to run a number of simulations that are challenging for other simulation frameworks. Here we're just dragging cloth over super, super sharp spikes, which is very easy to get snagged on, basically. Um, we also have an example where we tie a knot. And as we tie it, obviously, in the center of the knot, the contact forces become very strong. And so if you're not careful about handling that, it's easy for the simulation to think that um, the ribbons actually end up going through each other, and then the whole thing falls apart. And then finally, we have this uh, twisting example where we just keep winding it to get tighter and tighter contact. And once again, if we're not careful about the contact handling in, in the middle, um, either it would fall apart or it would grind to a halt and never finish. In this case, it actually does finish, which we're happy about. The problem, well, and just to visualize, there's a very, uh, there's a lot of very tight uh, contact in here. The problem with this is, in our, actually, in our second implementation, which was already improved dramatically over the first implementation, uh, this second implementation is based on uh, shared memory parallelism using TBB. And despite uh, our speed ups, we're still looking at simulation time around a month. Uh, for this twister, so it's not exactly it's not exactly fast. In fact, it's pretty slow. And what I'm talking about here is still a research project. This is not what we used in Frozen. This is not what we used in Tangled because it is darn slow. <laughs> so that's really one of the motivations for um, why I started talking with Sanjay and like. Hmm, churn plus plus sounds interesting. It has a lot of the same ideas of asynchrony that we're using in this framework. Seems like this might actually be a good fit. And hopefully, we can then take our old scaling plots, which are actually pretty pathetic. Um, we get negative scaling <laughs> uh, on even just moderate core counts. Um, and hopefully, by using churn plus plus, we can uh, do something better. And so, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sean, who will show what we've actually done to that end. I will talk about, can you hear me? Uh, so I will talk about how we put the cloud simulation code into Chan++ and uh, uh, the optimization we have done. So cloud piece is uh, decomposed into a 2D triangular mesh. And the mesh is further partitioned using matrix among work units, which represents as a 1D array in Chan++. As you can see on the right figure, uh, sorry, uh, different uh, class piece is divided into different char uh, array elements, and they further mapped into different processors. 
uh, as Lasmas has introduced, uh, the basic faults in the cloud simulation is material faults. So it has stretch faults and bending faults. Uh, they all, so in the stretch faults and bending faults, each triangular mesh element will all need to interact with the neighboring mesh elements. If the mater uh, material faults continue like that, the cloud piece may penetrate with each other, which we don't want it to happen in a cloud simulation. That's why we need um, collision detection after multiple steps of material faults. So these multiple steps of material faults is called a collision window, which is adjustable in our implementation. Uh, at the end of the collision detection, uh, we will, based on the whether we have found these collisions in the past simulation window, we will determine whether we should continue the simulation if no collision has been found, or we should roll back to the beginning of the collision window. Uh, when we roll back, we will we add another kind of false, which is penalty false, to prevent cloud piece from penetrating with each other. Uh, again, at the end of the collision window, we will conduct the collision detection and the simulation proceeds only when uh, no collisions has been found. So uh, in the collision detection, we have two phases. In the first phase is a broad phase collision detection, which use a faster but more cost-green method to detect potential collisions. So we use uh, the existing library uh, in CHAM++, the Collide library, um, in the Collab library, it creates bounding box for the trajectory of each triangle. As you can see here, we have the uh, bounding box for the red triangle, blue triangle, and the green triangle. Uh, if two bounding box falls into the same grid, the Collab library will determine them as uh, colliding with each other. So as it turns out, the red triangle collides with the blue triangle, and the, the collide library also thinks that the red triangle collides with the green triangle. However, if you take a closer look at the tra trajectory of the, these two triangles, they actually have no overlap with each other. So this is the false positive result. Um, another source of po false positive is when um, the, the two triangles uh, com uh, two triangles reach the same point at a different time step. So the narrow phase is to filter out all these false positive results. We will take a closer look at the position of each triangle at, the, at each time step. First, we distribute the potential collision results evenly among all the processors. So this is timeline view from the projections showing the activities on different processors. Uh, the x-axis is the time, and the y-axis is the uh, processors. It's from P0 on the top to P63 on the bottom. The different colors uh, show the different competitions conducted by different processors. So at the beginning, uh, it's a blue bar, which is the communication. So they need to talk to each other to get the trajectory of vertices. And afterwards, they will start the computation. Uh, as you can see, it's clearly that uh, different processors may have different lengths of the yellow bar, which corresponds to the computation. So why, we, so why there's a computation imbalance, even we have already evenly distributed the potential collision results? So the reason is that uh, the time spent on each collision pair uh, is different, um, as it is because each vertex may have different trajectory lengths, or because collision happens earlier or later in the trajectory may also have an effect. So to solve this computation imbalance problem, we take the variation into consideration by profiling of the past uh, narrow phase detection and, uh, and use the principle of persistence. So based on the profiling, we are able to get a better uh, computation balance this time. So I can see the orange bar is corresponding to the 
narrow phase computation work, it is uh, quite balanced among all the processors. However, the problem is come from the uh, blue bar. Uh, the different processor may have different lengths of blue bar which corresponding to the communication. That's why the computation gets delayed on certain processors. So now we observe a uh, now we observe another problem, which is communication imbalance. So to solve this communication imbalance problem, we have come up with two strategies. So in the first strategy, we are, we are replicating the data on the heavily loaded processors to a few other processors. So when our child requests the data, uh, it now has more choice. So it can help us distri distribute the communication request. So after this optimization, it looks really good that uh, the com in this, t uh, this time, the, either the communication at the beginning is balanced much better and the computation is also much better than the previous result. However, the problem comes before you can actually start any computation because you need to replicate the data first. So why does the data replication take so long? It's almost the same as the real work you have done in the narrow phase detection. First of all, it's because the large message size in this problem, the trajectory of each vertex can be of megabytes. Secondly, uh, even though you replicate data to fill other processors, it didn't fully utilize the, uh, all the replication, replication in the sense that uh, uh, there's less data reuse in this problem when, 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 when you replicate the data to a few copies, maybe still only one or two charts needs that data. So this doesn't seem to work. So we can uh, another strategy is to consider the physical node as an execution unit. So in the same node, the processors with less communication can naturally offload the computation work from the processors with more communication. So this is naturally enabled by asynchronous message driven execution feature in CHAMP++. So when a message contains the narrow phase detection work arrives at certain node, on that processor, on that node, the idle processors can uh, pick up the, uh, can pick up the computation work. Uh, priority based execution is also important here because we don't want the any uh, processors that are already overloaded with communication work to com pick up the computation work before it finish all the communication requests. So we favor the communication requests over the message that contains the computation work. So this is the, again the timeline uh, projection wheel after this optimization. So um, it is uh, executing on four nodes each node has 15 processors. And, oh. um, so here you can see that uh, the blue bar is the communication work and the yellow bar is the uh, computation work. So at certain processors which it has more communication work, the yellow bar, which contains the computation work, always comes after. This is because of the usage of the priority. And also, you can observe that when on, cer on certain node, when some processors is overloaded with the communication work, at the same time, other processors, which doesn't have so many communication requests, can naturally begin the computation work. So even though uh, each processors, uh, each processor may have different communication computation ratio, but the work gets balanced overall. So, so far we have talked about the optimization we have done in the collision detection phase. Um, however, there's another important phase which is false computation, which includes the material false um, as shown in the M here and the penalty false, which is a response to the collisions. Um, in a typical phase, Face by face simulation, you will have the material false uh, first, and then at the end, you start the penalty false, and the end, the penalty false, another step of the material false. 
So since penalty faults is associated with the collisions, and the collisions only happen in a few regions in the cloud case, so the penalty faults is not balanced uh, so well. As you can see, only P3 is, uh, has penalty faults um, in this case, and uh, there's a lot of idle time because of the imbalance of the false distribution. So to solve this problem and to remove the and to remove the barrier between the penalty faults and the material faults, we further decompose the, the material faults and the penalty faults. So uh, the thing about the, the penalty springs instead of a, a pure reflection comes down to getting the physics right. Uh, because in order to get good uh, energy conservation and momentum conservation, you need the symplectic um, structure of the integrator. And if you start doing reflections, then uh, that throws a whole another um, that opens up another can of worms. Um, have a different paper on that, um, but getting that to work with deformable objects is actually not easy at all. So. Uh, so in our fur further decomposition, we decompose the material files into the material files that depends on the uh, external communication and the local uh, material files calculation. So whenever a message arrives, uh, contains the material files calculation, uh, the message, uh, wait, the processor that the message target to will pick up that message. For the penalty files, we over decompose it into small pieces so that all other processors on the same node can help with the penalty files calculation. So whenever a penalty files arrive at a certain node, on the, uh, that node, the idle processor can help with the penalty files calculation. So after this, this is an illustration of how that works. So as you can see, uh, PE1 and PE2 can start to help the PE3 with the penalty faults, except the PE4. So why is that? Uh, because the P, um, PE4, the message invokes the long material faults calculation I actually arrives earlier than the penalty faults message. Uh, so even, even though we could not get help from everyone, but still we have better idle time as illustrated in this graph. Uh, we shorten the idle time. So uh, we in, in order to get help from everyone to help with the penalty force calculation to better distrib distribute the load, we add a low cost node level phase barrier before the long material force calculation begins. So unless everyone has reached that point, we won't start the material force calculation. So in this case, PE4 can participate to help PE3 with penalty faults and further shorten the idle time. So this is the projection we'll compare these two strategies. On the top is the uh, without the node level phase barrier, and on the bottom is with the node level phase barrier. So uh, as you can see on the top, only a few processors can help with the penalty faults ca ca computation, which is originally from P51 and it's overloaded. However, on the second, on the bottom graph, you can see that everyone can help with the penalty force calculation, which show as a purple color here. And then there's a, a face barrier before the long material force calculation begins, which is the blue bars here. So this may not easy to illustrate, uh, to, to observe that uh, how much time you have saved after the node level face barrier. So let's take a look at the usage profile. Uh, this is usage profile of the same 15 processors. <coughs> and uh, the first column is average utilization. As you can see, that uh, the utilization improved from 78% to 83%. And in the left graph without a node level barrier, the P51 is um, overloaded. 
and well in the second graph it's uh, achieve a better load balancing. So after all this optimization, uh, we have uh, conducted experiments using different uh, uh, benchmarks as Rasmus has showed the, their real simulation before. So the problem sets increase from Bolan to, to Cloud Strip to Rift Node and to Twister. Uh, Twister is a much bigger problem here, so we actually managed to scale to 120 processors. For the other example, we can, as you can see, from 7 to 60 processors, we are able to achieve a better scaling once the uh, problem set increases. So for the RIF node, it scales to 45 processors, and the, the, the um, we are able to shorten the real simulation time by half compared to the shared, shared memory code. So corresponding to what I have talked at the beginning, uh, the, the cloud simulation includes the false calculation and the broad face detect collision detection and narrow face detection, which is shown as here a one big step using the time profile. So um, as you can see, the false calculation has achieved very good balance, and then I was, we still have a little problem at the uh, load imbalance at the broad face, and at the narrow face, not all the processors finish at the same time. This is because we have achieved a good internode uh, load balancer, so we still need to work on how to achieve a good internode load balancing. Uh, 